basis for spiritual power the basis that decides that generates one's spirituality either on the psychic powers or on the spiritual development towards nibbana they are called iddhi pada iddhi can be translated as higher powers abilities skills pada is base base for higher powers now i'm not planning to talk on the definitions of these terms characteristics and the specific explanations based on these particular words it departed i'm going to talk on the buddha's life and his students who cultivated developed on the path of nibbana and how these iddipadas in number they are four these four types of bases of spirituality bases of spiritual developments supported those enlightened masters to achieve their higher status of supra mundane path let me explain one of the buddha's eminent student his name was rattapala one of the richest families was his family background he was a millionaire and after his fad- father's demise he is bound to be or destined to be the seti or the rich man in the country he was richer than even the king of that country he was living in the country called kururata kind of a country belong to or the situated in the area near delhi these days and buddha happened to visit this country and people they went to see the buddha and listen to the dhamma and this ratapala the young man he was observing hundreds of people gathered and uh, moving to one direction being curious he asked them where are you going they said to the buddha gautam the buddha who renounced his shakya heritage a king renounced to become a hermit a monk he is being enlightened and now he is teaching dhamma for the others enlightenment we are going to see that buddha then this ratapala just for the curiosity he went to see the buddha and sitting at the corner of that vast assembly he listened to the buddha's teachings by the end of the teachings he was so inspired by the buddha's admonitions buddha's teachings he thought 
I am in the wrong type of life. The life that I am living at home, at palace, with my parents, with my wives, with all the facilities is not the life for me. The monk's life is the life for me. And he went to the Buddha and sought from Buddha the monk's hood, the monastic life. Buddha said, look young man, we cannot ordain just as you are asking it. You have to get the permission from your parents because this rule had been promulgated after the ordination of Prince Rahula. King Suddhodana, the grandfather, came and requested the Buddha, please don't do that again. Don't ordain anyone without the permission of the parents. So that incident created the condition, created these rules in Buddhism that anybody who wants to be a monastic, a monk or a nun, his guardians, his parents must give the permission. Without parental permission, nobody can be ordained. So Ratabala went back home, asked his parents, mother and father, my eyes opened to another direction. I do not belong to this life as a householder anymore. I want to be ordinated. I want to be a monk. Give me the permission. I want to renounce. And this is the only child of the family. It is something impossible. Even for an ordinary family to let go of the only child of the family. But this is a family of a millionaire, rich man's family. How can they let go of him? This is the only inheritor of their entire wealth. Nobody else is there. So the mother and father completely rejected. You are the only son. The only, the sole inheritor of all this fortune. Why you want to be a mendicant? Why you want to be a meditator in a forest? Why, why you want to be a monk? Enjoy this life while at home and do merits. That's good enough for you. So the parents were rejecting completely. Again and again, son was asking to give them, give him the permission, and the parents were rejecting. Ratapala found that there is no way that he can gain the permission from his parents. So ultimately he came to the conclusion, decision, a very strong decision that he lie down on the floor with the saying that as long as you don't give me the permission to be a monk, I will be lying here. No food, no water. I'll be a dead body. I'll die here. 
if you don't give me the permission to be a monk. Parents were begging him not to do this. And they thought, after some time, when he's getting hungry, when he's getting weak, because this is a young man born on a bed of roses, born into luxury, born into power, money, prestige. He has no experience of the misery of the life. He doesn't know hunger. He doesn't know the misery of hunger. So when he experiences that misery of hunger, he will get up. But there was a certain spiritual inclination, attraction in this young man so powerful. He had this chanda. Chanda is translated, it means desire. But of course we know that desire is usually in the wrong sense that we know. It is about raga, lust, lobha, craving. It is always immoral sense of understanding is related to this desire. But Chanda has something wholesome, something beyond this unwholesome understanding of the desire. Chanda is to cut to karmata, to do something, desire to do something. And it is always based on the negative or positive. Spiritual, psychological background is the deciding factor that decides what kind of desire, whether it is wholesome or unwholesome. Not the desire itself. If the desire is to do something spiritually wholesome, that desire is something commendable. So Chanda is that desire to do something good, Kattu Kamata, to do something, to do something wholesome. So, Chanda itself is morally indefinable. You cannot define Chanda, whether it is good or bad. It is to be decided based on what kind of motivation is there behind this Chanda. So, if somebody has this desire to do something good, the motivation is to do something good, that desire that Chanda is on the wholesome side. If somebody has the desire to do something immoral, sinful, painful for others, suffering for himself and others, basically that desire is driven by the motivations of unwholesome. So this young man's Chanda the desire is based on moral, wholesome kind of driving forces. Motivation is wholesome. And then he has the energy to do so. He has that strength, that iron in his heart. Uh, that is the second driving factor, second base for spirituality. We call it virya, the energy is there. And then the third one is mind. Mind is set up. 
mind is constructed towards that spiritual direction, that mind is not wavering towards the sensual pleasures anymore. It is directed towards the spiritual success. And then the last one is investigation. He did not come to the conclusion of leaving the household life, renounce to the homelessness, to the spirituality, not out of blind faith, not out of heresy, not out of a gossip, but after investigation, after examination, and that is the fourth spiritual background, spiritual base for spirituality. So, Chanda, Virya, Chitta, Vimansa, desire, energy, mind, and investigation is there behind his effort to renounce a palace to become a monk, renounce millions to become a monk, to renounce everything worldly to become a monk. So he is lying down, parents are begging, they are utilizing all those efforts to get him out of his grit, to forget this nonsense in their eyes, it is a nonsense, and to get back to the normal life. But this man's, this young man's, the basis for spirituality is so strong, it is unwaverable. Nobody can shake on them. Nobody can change his determination. He is lying down. The parents went to his friends, friends from the childhood. They came and those friends asked him, to give up this determination and not to hurt parents so much. But this man's eyes are open to the spirituality. He's not in the worldly, mundane interest anymore. Because in the eye of the Dhamma, what you experience as suffering in one particular life is an aorta of suffering in comparison to the suffering that you experience throughout the lifetimes in this beginningless and endless sansaric journey. Whosoever has opened his eyes to the Dhamma, we call it Dhamma Chakku Mudapadi, he has no inclination to the realms of sensual pleasures anymore. He see this life and everything else just as something miserable, something suffering. For him, Nibbana is the only comfort. Nibbana is the only refuge. Not the house, not the money, but the Nibbana. So his Dhamma eye has been opened by the Buddha and now he has aroused 
the spiritual basis and based on this spiritual basis he wants to build up his spirituality and reach to the summit of it that is his only inclination that is his only aim and goal here so he is lying down if you don't give me the permission I will die here ultimately parents with utmost reluctance gave the permission he left his palace and went to the Buddha though he was so eagerly with so much of effort gave up his worldly life and joined the monastic life of the Buddha yet he is not having that much of parami that much of former fulfillments of perfections within him to attain Nibbana so fast it took 16 years of practice continuous practice for him to attain the final liberation of Nibbana after attaining the Nibbana he understood himself I am enlightened now no need to no need to announce to the world no need to tell anyone that I am enlightened because enlightenment those days was not a business purpose today it is another story he understood that he is beyond this show he belongs to the other show of the world he has gone beyond nobody can bring him back anymore so he decided to pay a visit to his parents he went to the Buddha sought permission from Buddha and after 16 years now he went to see his parents to Tulla Kottita the city where he used to live Padu was inside his home and his parents had developed such a abho such a dislike towards the monastics from that day of his novitiate whenever they see a monk or a nun they just hurl abusive words they just scold them and throw ugly abusive bad words towards those monks and nuns when Ratapala came home whenever Ratapala Arahant Ratapala came home he did not recognize him and in the same manner he started abusing using harsh rough words and scolding chasing away when Rabbi Rattapala when Rabbi Rattapala came there with his begging ball but he got nothing only the abusive words so he moved out A slave girl of that family came out with some old food to throw away. Then when Abhattapala said, Sister, if you are throwing away that food, just put it in my begging ball because you are just throwing away. When she heard these words and with the features, she understood immediately that this is Rattapala, who renounced 16 years back. He has come back. They did not recognize him. She quickly went, ran to 
into the house and informed. You just heard those abusive words to your own son. He has come back. They came, apologized to him and invited him to the next day meal. When he came back, father and mother, still trying to get him back, placed a chair and in the both sides of his chair they heaped up gold, silver and all sorts of gems, all his treasures, mountains of treasure around his chair and covered them with some cloth. Whenever Ratapala came in and sat down on that chair, then they opened that covers and they showed those wealth, so much of wealth. You are the inheritor for all this wealth. Now you got your 16 years of monk's life. Give it up. Come back to this wealth. But when Rabbi Rattapala was not moving, because now those Iddipadas, those bases for spirituality has been embedded, implanted within him and he has been transformed by those bases of spirituality. Chanda, Virya, Chitta, Vimangsa, Desire, F energy, mind and the investigation. He has become them. Before they were his background, before they were his base, now he has become those bases. He has been completely transformed by those bases. Nobody can move him from that spiritual path. His parents did their utmost. Nothing happened. Then they called his former wives to come and persuade him. Nothing happened. He just took his meal and vanished to the thin air and disappeared from them. He is the monk who had to struggle most to renounce and his struggle is absolutely based on these four Iddhi fathers Chanda, Virya, Chitta, Vimangsa. After his renunciation as a monastic, when he is cultivating his base was this four factors of spirituality. Now, Buddha himself, when he was 80, getting close to the 80 years of age, he was getting so weak, he was getting so fragile, yet there is so much of strength within him. He could have lived until he becomes 120. Because it is the interim eon or it is the Ayu Kappa, the eon of lifespan at that time. Now, the incident was, Buddha was staying in the city called Vishala and while staying there, he was begging 
or going on his arms round in the city. And one day, he asked Venerable Ananda, Ananda, let's go to the shrine called Chapala. Take the robe that we use for lying down, for sitting, and let's go there to spend our evening in this Chapala shrine. And while sitting at the Chapala shrine, Lord Buddha just uttered, just said, Ananda, this Vishala, the city of Vishala is so beautiful. This Chapala shrine and the other rest of the shrines around are so beautiful. And Ananda, whoever has developed and cultivated the four bases for spiritual power and fully perfected in them could, if he so wished, live on for the eon or for the remainder of the eon. He just remind him, whosoever has developed the four bases of spirituality, what are they? Chanda, Virya, Chitta, Mimamsa, Desire, Energy, Mind and the Investigation. Whosoever has developed this to the perfect level, he can exist with his power, with his spiritual power for an eon or, more, or the rest of the eon. It means now he has laid around 80 years, he can live up to 120. For three times, Buddha repeated these words. But it says, at that time, the Mara, the devil, has distracted Venerable Ananda that he did not answer, he did not heed the Buddha's words properly. It says that Mara, the devil, created some fearful visions, illusions to Venerable Ananda because Venerable Ananda was not an Arahant at that time. He was just a Sotapanna. Still Mara can play some jokes on him. Yeah. So, Mara had some tricks on Venerable Ananda, at the right time when the Buddha was saying this, and Venerable Ananda missed the hint, missed the hint that this is the time to invite Buddha for him to live a, an eon, an eon or more. So he missed it. Buddha repeated three times. But still, Venerable Ananda did not invite. So, as Buddha found that he was not invited, then he let Venerable Ananda go and rest somewhere else. And after Venerable Ananda gone, the demon, the devil, the Mara came to him and asked Lord Buddha that let the fortunate one 
now attain final nibbana he asked buddha to pass away then the buddha said be at ease evil one it will not be long before the tathagata's final nibbana take place Three months from now, the Tathagata will attain final Nibbana. And after that, this is the determination, this is the grit, that we call it Ayu Sanskara. Mindfully and, with, and clear comprehension, relinquished his final formation. Mindfully, with clear comprehension, he relinquished his final formation, Ayu Sanskara. And it says there were untimely thunderings, earth shook. There were some natural impact on the earth with that exclamation with that determination that the Buddha made to pass away after three months. Such a power was granted to Buddha to determine when he is passing away, to determine to live an eon if he was invited with the practice of these four bases of spirituality. So in that case, these four bases of spirituality are inclusive in the practice of middle path. The middle path is either based on these four spiritual bases or four spiritual bases are included in the middle path. That's why once Buddha said, I am an arahant because I practiced these four spiritual bases, Chanda Virya Chitta Vimangsa. And this Chanda Chitta Virya Vimangsa is in the middle path. Middle path is not activated without these four bases of spirituality. So somebody who practices these four bases of spirituality is the one who can develop certain supramundane developments. Supramundane is achieved with these four bases in the past, in the present, or in the future. Whosoever develops in the spirituality, he must have the firm, strong basis of these four Chanda, Virya, Chitta, Vimangsa. So for the perfect Buddha, His development on these four bases are so powerful, so perfect. With the assistance of that power, he could even decide how long he is going to live. If he was invited, of course. It is an ayukappa or an interim yen. Now, 
this merits to explain something about kappa kappa or kalpa english translated it means it says ion there are three types of ions interim interim ion incalculable ion and the great ion what is an interim ion interim ion is the lifetime lifetime of a human being and these lifetimes are never similar in all the times in the humanity it goes down to the level of 10 years and it rises up to thousands of years now we can see that in the world the lifetime of humanity human beings are getting lower and lower lower and lower it will end at the age of 10 and then up again it will rise up to thousands of years this is the lifetime of a human being then 20 such human lifetimes or 20 such interim ions similar to incalculable ions 20 interim ion interim ion is the lifetime in general now at the buddha's time it was 120 that is the ayu kappa or the interim ion at that time so if he was invited he could have lived that kind of years 120 that is the general lifetime now it is going down it will go down until the age of 10 now you can see the trend nobody is living 120 these days even reaching 100 is very rare to find so age is going down when the age is going down the desires are getting stronger desires are so strong that's why this is the age Buddhas are very rare. Buddhas are so rare to find, especially a Buddha, Buddha the perfect would not arise in this age. Buddha the perfect, Samma Sambuddha, would arise among the humanity when the human age is at most 120. So when Gautama the Buddha arrives on this earth among humanity, the age limit was one hundred and twenty. Yeah. So twenty such interim eons create one incalculable eon. four such incalculable eons create or is the time span of a great eon mahakappa mahakappa now when we read the buddha story the time span 
that Gautama Bodhisattva sacrificed for his enlightenment is as the Pali explanation it says Chatura Sankhya Kalpa Laksha Chatur Asankhya Kalpa Laksha Chatur Asankhya Kalpa it means in calc 400,000 incalculable eons 400,000 incalculable eons Now, incalculable eon, a singular one, is made out of 20 interim eons. So, such incalculable eon, 400,000 times he spent for his fulfillment of perfections towards Nibbana. So, for such incalculable eons together make one great eon. So, these are the types of eons we find in Buddhism. Interim eon, Ayukap, the life span of a human being, general life span. 20 such interim eons make one incalculable eon. One, four incalculable eons make one great eon. Anantara Kap, Asankhya Kap, Maha Kap. Interim eon, incalculable eon and uh, great eon. So, for a meditator, for a person, for an individual who developed the four bases of spirituality to the perfect level, he can exist in this life, in the life in that very life he developed those four bases of his spirituality until to the end of that eon. That is the idea. So such a powerful, significant background is represented by these four basis of spirituality. It is, they are the basis, they are the background, they are the foundation on which this citadel of spirituality grow up. You remove the foundation, the citadel is no more. They are the foundation for arahanthood, for the enlightenment. They are the foundation for other spiritual powers other spiritual developments, psychic powers. Once in Sanyutta Nikaya, Buddha found that a group of monks being so lazy, being not so active in the practice, but wasting their time in discussions and other wasteful things. Buddha wanted to create the Sangvega in them. Sangvega is creating a speed for the development of spirituality. To create this Sangvega, to hasten them to practice he asked Venerable Mokkalana to do something. These monks were sitting in the basement of a big temple, 
ನಿಗಾರ ಮಾತು ಪಾಸಾದ ವಿಶಾಖಾ ಟೆಂಪಲ್ ವಿಶಾಖಾ ಬಿಲ್ಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಟೆಂಪಲ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಮಂಗ್ಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಸ್ಟ್ರಾಂಗ್ ಒನ್ ಸೊ ದೀಸ್ ಮಂಗ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಸಿಟಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಬೇಸ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವೇಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ದರ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಇಟ್ ಸೇಸ್ ವೆನರಬಲ್ ಮೊಗ್ಗಾಲನ್ ವಿತ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಟೋ ವಿತ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಟೋ he just shook he just trembled this big palace like temple palatial temple the monks were scared and they asked buddha there is no earthquake and no wind can shake this palatial temple like that what's the reason what is the reason for this kind of a shaking trembling of this temple then buddha pointed out it is your brother monk he did with his psychic power just using the toe of his foot he shook he made a shock throughout this temple then those monks asked the buddha how come he is so powerful how did he get all these powers then buddha said he got these powers he became so powerful because he developed chanda desire virya energy chitta mind vimansa investigation in him he developed these bases based on these bases he developed and he became psychologically spiritually this powerful so he created this has to practice in this group of monks who are wasting their time so likewise in buddhism as the factors for enlightenment these four bases for spirituality plays a major role 